My name is Christopher Medley. I'm a marketing professional, and I've got a theory about soccer that I think you'll find interesting. So a couple of weeks ago, I was cruising the net when I came across this. And if you like soccer, well, welcome to America. See, our country already has entertainment, so watching people chase a ball for four hours to end 0-0 is not enjoyable unless, of course, the bleachers collapse and half of Europe dies. <laughs> Why does that joke and others like it always get such a laugh? In fact, why is it so easy for people to hate on soccer even though it is played by more people, is just as American as other American sports, and features just as much excitement and highlight-worthy moments of athletic excellence? Why is a low-scoring soccer game considered dull when a pitcher's duel or defensive slugfest is considered thrilling? I believe it's due to something that is missing in the way in which soccer is presented to Americans on television. And from what I can see, the American model for televised soccer has been created by cobbling together bits and pieces of the things that work well in other countries. We have Latin America, where la pasión reigns supreme. Then there's Italy, with their constant second-guessing of coaches and obsession with positioning. And my favorite, jolly old England, where they discuss the action on the field, and everything off it as well. But the problem is, this outward looking approach overlooks the fact that nobody is better at entertaining people with one of these than the good old US of A. This isn't an American thing, this is a TV thing. In America's big three sports, the television viewing experience prominently features an element that is woefully lacking in soccer. This element generates respect for the sport and the athletes that play, engages and stimulates, creating an interactive experience that encourages higher brain function during viewing, actually improves the viewer's ability in the sport, and can make the viewing experience compelling and worthwhile regardless of score, scoring, importance of game, or even to some extent the quality of play. I call it the mechanics of sport, which I have broken down into three overlapping categories. Technique, team dynamic, and game control. Now I'm going to show you a few clips and whatnot in order to dig a little deeper. We start with technique. Recognize this guy? That's right, he can hammer a 60 plus mile an hour knuckleball over a wall and under a bar. Freaking amazing. After 25 plus years of playing and watching soccer, I've got no clue how he does that. This guy drops knuckles also, but when I watch him do it, I'm told about the movement and cooperation of his feet, his hips, his elbow, his shoulder, his grip, as well as the orientation and condition of the ball. And it doesn't stop there. I also get schooled about all of these factors. All this to throw a baseball. The big three sports do a fantastic job of educating viewers on the primary movements that make up what is happening. By understanding these acts on a base physiological level, viewers are even more impressed by them. As viewers, we can then take this understanding and appreciation and apply it over and over again to every player we watch and even to ourselves when playing. The mechanics of technique are either glossed over or completely ignored in soccer. If they were properly presented, viewers would not only better appreciate what goes into a player ripping the net, but understand the reasons why it doesn't always go down that way. Because in the big three sports, they understand that there is just as much entertainment value to be had from making sense of poor technique. A typical soccer game consists of thousands of incredible displays of skill and athleticism, most of which go by unmentioned and therefore unnoticed by many viewers. Every time the mechanics of technique aren't broken down, it represents a missed opportunity to educate viewers, be them fans or coveted would-be fans. This education is the first step towards appreciation and ultimately respect for soccer and the athletes that play it. Lionel Messi is incredible. How does he do it? Magic! Messi magic, Messi magic, Messi magic is the only thing I ever hear about how he does what he does. If I hear Messi magic one more time, I'm going to lose my sh- Messi's ability to puke nearly every defender he faces is a result of extraordinary balance, lateral quickness, and anticipation that borders on precognition. The dude sees three moves ahead. This guy just had the most prolific season in the history of the NFL. Magic was not given credit. You picking up what I'm putting down? Next we'll discuss the mechanics of team dynamic. Ever heard of these guys? Behold, the passing brilliance of Barcelona. Look at them go. The funniest thing I've ever heard to describe their style of play is champagne soccer. Yet for all the praise they receive, nobody bothers to explain how they pass like this when nobody else can. In history. When you watch this, what do you see? 
Many viewers just follow the white ball pinging about, but there's so much more to it. Check out that little stutter step they all take as the ball approaches that allows them to be balanced when they make the next pass. Look at the relaxed posture that helps keep their feet soft. Look at where they deliver the ball to the next guy, which means that they don't have to lunge and risk a clumsy touch. Even if the ball doesn't go to them, they're all squaring their body and getting into the proper position as a unit, meaning that they don't have to make those adjustments on the fly with the ball approaching fast. Knowing all of that might make one's next experience watching Barcelona do their thing more enjoyable, don't you think? Football! Football does a fantastic job of helping the viewer to understand the key contributions of players without the ball. The same cannot be said for soccer, where all the focus is typically directed towards the ball or the person with it. Check out this next play. LeBron surveys, finds Wade, who lays it in! What would you guess is the next thing that the announcer says? Nice play, lovely display of skill, nah. And how did Dwayne Wade get so open? That's right, not what happened, but how it happened. They've been calling basketball games like this for so long that it's second nature. It's pretty simple, actually. He's going to circle around, and then they clear out the backside so there's no backside help. And Rubio just comes around the curl, and Minnesota's just not there. It's, it's pretty simple action. You see, it's pretty simple, actually. Now check out this play from a recent game where essentially the same thing happens. Thinking the defender on the far side won't get there in time, the defender on the near side steps over to help. Now that the backside defense has been cleared out, the attacker lays off a pass for an unrushing player. That one step towards the ball that the defender took was all that was needed to leave the backside vulnerable. The attacker gets the ball, takes a touch to create separation from the defender who has lost all momentum, and puts it away. When we see a play like this, both in real time and in replay, our attention is always directed towards the ball, without anyone ever asking the question, how did he get so open? The mechanics of team dynamic could also be used to help us understand in real time the cause and effect behind the decisions that players make. Now I'm going to discuss a brilliant play, the type that never gets any love in a soccer game. Great long passing control, but we ain't here for that. Dempsey's got the ball here with an attacker on his back. From the looks of it, he has two options. If he tries to work it up line for a cross, he'll probably not get it off given the defender's position, not to mention that the long ball he ran down overshot the rest of his team. The easy play would be to hold it up and look for a back pass, but that would send the ball right back into the teeth of the midfield. Dempsey cleverly chooses secret option number three. He takes half a touch towards the sideline. That touch gives him one step of separation from his defender, which is all he needs to bring his right foot around and face the defender who never gets a clear play on the ball. Now that he is facing the defender, he can still go up or down the line, but he could also take the defender one-on-one -on -one or look to play a ball back into the middle, effectively doubling his options. Dempsey passes into the middle, where wouldn't you know it, four players have worked themselves into the attacking third. The pass finds an open Maurice Seydu, who from there has even more options from which to choose. All of this from a little half turn that happened in a flash. Dempsey's piece of skill, something that maybe a handful of people would be able to pull off in a nation of 300 million, didn't get a second look or even a mention, probably because of what didn't happen immediately after. Understanding not only what players and teams do, but how and why is important. Because it provides viewers with the knowledge base needed to interact with the sport they are watching. Knowledge. Drink it in. Finally, we come to game control. The mighty punter. Accounts for no points, but does that mean he doesn't affect the game outcome? Of course not. The punter plays a crucial role in winning the field position battle. The number 8 hitter drawing a 2 out walk with nobody on base may seem insignificant, begins importance when viewers learn how it affects the pitch count and sets up the next inning. This guy getting hacked may not even result in any points, but the foul itself has enough late game impact to take up nearly half the scoreboard. Soccer on TV does an inadequate job of helping viewers understand the importance of game control, the positioning passes and plays big and small that go into attaining it, and how it is ultimately used to affect the outcome. Here we have a clip of France's national team working the ball around their own net. Even when the U.S. tries to press for the ball, they don't create a turnover and France is allowed to maintain possession for as long as they please. Many viewers would consider this boring to watch because as you can see, neither goal is even in sight and there's essentially no chance of these passes resulting in a goal. Or is there? Fifteen minutes later, we see France once again working it in their own end. 
but because they've already demonstrated a total ability to do so without losing possession, the attacker doesn't even bother pressing for the ball, preferring to get back into a deeper position. Through an effective passing game, France has essentially laid claim to their entire half of the field. Fast forward to the second half, and we have Tim Howard hammering a goal kick downfield because unlike France, the US had not demonstrated the ability to work the ball up from their own end without problems. France's goal was scored in three touches, the first of which was a header from the central defender that was in an advanced position that his team's defense had earned through their domination of their own end. That allowed more midfielders to creep into the attack where they were able to generate the break that led to the goal. So as you can see, those passes we saw at the beginning, along with dozens more just like them, had a significant impact on the end result. If more viewers were made aware of this, they would find those early passes to be much more interesting and better understand that a lot more goes into most goals than the ball simply crossing the white line. But in order for that to happen, the television product must work to connect the dots for viewers. Because as it stands, too many viewers are left waiting for chances and goals, which is not the way to watch a soccer game. Every soccer game I watch, I hear a number of wildly ambiguous statements that alone don't do anything to help anybody's understanding of the sport. Think about it. In a soccer game, I'll hear something like, the change to a 4-4-2 formation is leading to more chances. Well, that's super, but how? In football, they would never get away with saying that a team's new look 4-3 defense is leading to less points from the other team. It's ridiculous to even suggest it. They show us exactly where players are located, what they do on each play, and how it creates problems for the opposing offense. I always hear that Xavi Hernandez makes his teammates better. They say the same thing about Steve Nash. Then they follow up by showing endless in-game replays of him doing things like drawing defenders and finding the open man, making good decisions in transition, or locating his passes in a way that allow teammates to catch and shoot in rhythm. And my favorite, the shot that misses 30 yards wide and I'll hear, he didn't quite hit that one the way he wanted. Yeah, thanks for the next level analysis. If that was all a baseball announcer had to say every time a player hit a foul ball, he wouldn't last a day. I could go on and on. I believe that effectively implementing the mechanics of soccer into the American television viewing experience could do more to boost ratings, win over fans, improve play, and ultimately generate revenue than any other efforts out there, and for much less money. What's more is it could create a unique competitive advantage for the domestic TV product. When it comes to soccer, the United States has been behind the eight ball for, well, forever. But a superior viewing experience could work to draw interest amongst the international audience from an unprecedented angle. It's exciting stuff. So there you have it. My name is Christopher Medley, and it's my dream to have a job in soccer. I would love nothing more than to put my ideas into practice and to help grow the sport I love, a sport that's given me so much. My email address is below. Please drop me a line so we can discuss opportunities. Thanks for watching.